we have Mr. So first we have Dr. Professor Mizlubin Nizram. He has numerous publications in peer-reviewed journals and different seminar and workshop representation, national and international. He has won dozens of international and national projects. Currently, he's working on a research project with the University of Kharagpur and University of Malaysia. We do pray and hope that this project will successfully materialize. Next we have Dr. Smolia Bels Leo, Director of Nanotechnology, University of Tusti, Italy. He has different publications, more than five projects and 38 research projects. Next we have Dr. Muhammad Mazhar, Private Performance, Distinguished National Professor, although he did, don't need any kind of introduction, he's from Nasser Islamabad. He has done several publications. Next we have our national speaker, Dr. Rashad Hussain. He's Associate Professor, University of Management Sciences. He again has won different publications and worked on several projects. Next we have Dr. Hamidullah, Associate Professor, Hazari University, Mount Sahara. So here we go with our guest speakers. So now I would like to call our Vice Chancellor, Mr. Amitpuri, to come here for the welcome note. Thank you so much. Dr. Siran Ziliu from Italy, Dr. Mazhar, Distinguished National Professor, Dr. Amidullah, our invite guests from different institutions, faculty and students at Islamabad. To start with a brief overview of the University of Haripur, this university started as a campus of Hazara University back in 2008, and it used to be an abundant place an abandoned factory of frozen and turpentine with big halls, storage halls. And that's where we started our journey from 250 students and four departments. In 2012, it was given the status of an independent university. And uh, is from there that we started our academic journey. Currently, the university has two faculties, Faculty of Basic and Applied Sciences, with 13 departments, and Faculty of Social and Administ Administrative Sciences with five departments. So there are a total of 18 departments, and uh, we have a strength of almost 3,300 students currently enrolled with the University of Haripur. And we have uh, more than 50 academic programs, including bachelor's programs, master's program, MPhil and MS programs, and then PhD programs. We started, there was no building, we started with the building, and then we started strengthening our academic programs trying to focus on the quality. And one of the things that uh, we are focusing on is how we can we improve our academic quality. And for that, we have a dynamic quality enhancement cell here, which tries to implement the policies and regulations of HEC. And HEC in turn monitors the QECs program. So QECs indirectly are an indicator of how the university quality is being implemented. And then recently we got a W category, an 85% score, an 85 on a scale of 100, and we were awarded a W category, indicating that we are on the right track of improving the quality, academic quality of this institution. We are in, we are in, in an area, this is a suburban area where most of the people do not have or well off economically. 
So University of Kairo, although we do not have our, our tuition fees are not very significant, but still we try to offer scholarships to the students and almost 25%, 25% of the students and old students get some form of scholarship at our university. We try to facilitate them so that uh, uh, lack of financial resources does not deny our youngsters from education. Other than academic programs, one of the characteristics of this university is that uh, uh, we have a regular series of workshops, training programs, going seminars going on in this university. And uh, we have conducted hundreds of such training programs which provide exposure to our students other than the curricula that they are being taught. So they, and all the, their different societies which are organized. So the societies get an experience of organizing these events and our students get a regular exposure to all these activities. Uh, other than the, this program, we have started a skill development program also. So our, our students do not just have a degree, but they have the appropriate skills that are needed to get them employed. And one of these programs is with the cooperation of the KPI Tech, with the provincial department, that uh, we have started training skills in, in the field of IT, where we have done several batches. And it's a, I feel pleasure in, in saying that the students who got these skills, we have a data that more than 95% of those students got employed. So we have a regular that series where we are providing, trying to provide the, employed, the skills that are needed for our graduates to get employed. Uh, when we are talking about the IT, IT is a one of the, it's, it's a, almost a one fourth of our enrolled students are in, in the Department of IT where we are offering degrees in software engineering and computer sciences. And it's one of the most successful programs here. Uh, there was a program by Huawei uh, for establishing their Academy of Network. And uh, almost 137 institutions, higher education institutions in Pakistan applied for that. And University of Haripur was one of 11 universities that was selected throughout the Pakistan for establishment of HANA lab in, 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 in this university. And uh, we are second was only uh, at, um, the, there are only two universities in KP, uh, one in Topi and other uh, University of Haripur who were, who were selected for the establishment of this HANA lab. That uh, is, is a big honor for University of Haripur. And we have already started training our, our IT students here in, in this academy. Other than the academics, uh, we are trying to build our research programs, our faculty, other than teaching, they are also they, they are writing proposals and getting funding. Uh, so, the, so far we, we submitted 140 projects and uh, currently we have 25 projects uh, worth 70 million that are undergoing, that are on. We, we have started working on this, trying to establish uh, the research work and our labs. Uh, we, are, we are young yet, but still the 25 research projects running in this university uh, so far. Our faculty try, we, we, we encourage our faculty to participate in the international events, international conferences, where they keep on participating in all that event to get that exposure. And uh, currently, uh, last year, we had around 200 uh, publications by our faculty and, and, and students and trying to establish that, that research culture. Other than uh, the, the research, the things that have come out, we have uh, applied for the, some of the patents, and there are four patents that have been filed for, uh, from University of Haripur, and they are in process. Uh, we have linkages uh, with the rest of the country and international linkages, 
so far, so far we have uh, uh, 35 MOUs signed with different uh, institutions, uh, both inside the country and outside the country. You know, say Paripur is a, uh, is one of the few public sector universities in, in this uh, this province that has uh, implemented an ERP system where all of its business components are being automated. We have almost installed that starting from, from the admissions up to exam and award of degree. And it, all that is being now done online through our automated system, the ERP system that has been developed here and that is being implemented. Other than uh, these activities, we are trying to get involved with the community development also. You know, is trying to build up linkages with the community and uh, we offer our expertise for the capacity building of the local departments for the, for the institutions around us and there are always trainings where we try to build the capacity of all the institutions around us. That's one of the activities that uh, uh, we, we are performing also. You know, Haripur has also is also trying to build a culture of entrepreneurship here. We have established business incubation center. It has recently been established here. With uh, we have uh, for now we have a space for ten uh, uh, ten people here. But uh, so far uh, we have been having twenty five setups, of which seven have already graduated. And. Uh, we just started, but uh, it provided jobs to like 150 to 200 people, and uh, with a revenue on is, is two million. So we are working in that field also, where we can appreciate, we can develop a culture of entrepreneurship amongst our our students who can, and we, we provide them with a startup so that they can go out and be an, a, a successful entrepreneur. Uh, we have uh, also, we, 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 we are one of the few universities that uh, regarding this uh, entrepreneurship uh, activity, we, has, uh, we have an approved policy of uh, business incubation and IP rights and uh, we are working on that direction also. So overall, other than the, the academics, we are trying to focus on, on research, on community participation, on uh, the culture of entrepreneurship. We just took off and uh, we are on the way and hopefully we'll make uh, a, our deserved space in, in the education community very soon. Now coming to uh, this event today, there's no doubt that uh, nanoscience and technology is, a, is a one of the most amazing sciences uh, of, of the current time uh, that, has, that have made a tremendous breakthrough. Uh, for one reason that it has applications in almost every field uh, in, in agriculture, in biology, in, in, in engineering, in medicine and uh, the way it, it, is, it is expanding we can expect that the future decades would be dominated by, by this research by, by the nanoscience and technology and especially the, the most Serious challenges that we are facing globally now, including environment, environmental pollution, and shortage of energy. These are the two burning issues, global issues that we are facing. And nanoscience and technology has to offer solutions for both of them. Uh, it was amazing, I've seen uh, an, an article to, to find out that that these nanomaterials can not only stop the pollution from the point sources but now we have explored the science has explored the ways that we can mitigate the effect of already present carbon, carbon dioxide in the environment and the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide that can be already present levels can be reduced that's an amazing development and they've already done that and now they, they are working on the economically viable ways that how can we implement it economically and one day we will hear the news that now we, we are in a position using this uh, uh, nanomaterials we are in a position to shrink back the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that would be a big big breakthrough and so so are the applications in, 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 in case of uh, water pollution that we will be able to uh, isolate uh, uh, 
to remove all those toxic materials, toxins, dyes, and heavy metals, and even there, it's, it's amazing to know that there are sieves now, mechanical sieves that can sieve the teeny creature as, as small as viruses and bacteria. So there's a tremendous potential, and so so is the case in case of uh, uh, the, the bar uh, uh, problem that we, the energy problem that we are having. So nanomaterials can have, help in, in solar technologies, in batteries, and and and, and windmills, and, and you name. And and there is there, there's an application for that. It's cheap. It's reliable. Uh, and it's, you, you come up with, with the characteristics of the material that were never there when you go to the nanoscale. So I hope this conference here will introduce our uh, students, our faculty, to this new amazing science. And, and that will motivate them to start collaborating with the people who are, uh, who are out there in that field. And they start thinking about their future and having projects in, tho in those fields. And uh, we, are, we are fortunate to have uh, international speakers uh, who, and, and national speakers who are experts in their, that field. I hope our faculty and students will take this opportunity to develop collaborations with them and uh, get a time to discuss with them. And uh, at the end of this conference, we will have better understanding of the subject also. And we'll have uh, people that we can collaborate with with for establishment of, of our future projects and hope that uh, this conference will be a success in, 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 in that manner. So again, I uh, thank you very much to uh, all of our invited speakers, both international and national, and all the people who have come all the way from different institutions to come here. I wish, I, I, I hope your stay here will be comfortable and it will be a productive session. Thank you very much, everybody. For our this first session, our first speaker is Professor Dr. Misne Bene Nusran. He is a professor of chemistry, the School of Chemistry in the University of Malaya, Malaysia. Now he is presenting his talk on nano carriers in drug delivery system, emphasizes on nano lipson preparation and application. So I welcome Professor Dr. So I welcome Professor Dr. Miss Raven and Mr. Ray, please sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the University of Raipur for inviting me to uh, Pakistan. This is my second time in Pakistan. Uh, my first time was in Lahore. So, uh, I mean, uh, what I like about Pakistan is uh, I love the uh, food, uh, especially lamb, <laughs> lamb kebabs. <laughs> <laughs> so, first day uh, I was taken to one of the restaurants uh, to have lamb. So, very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not used to like you know standing here. Uh, in the roster, but Mike, can, can I? Okay. Um, can I just? Yeah, they can still listen to you. Can, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. If if my voice slowing down, please let me know. Okay, um, actually I come uh, not very long way, about six, uh, six hours, five, six hours flight from uh, Pakistan. And uh, I come from Sri Malaya. And if you look at... You cannot hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alright. So, okay now? Okay, this is actually uh, uh, my faculty. I have few few pictures, but I thought I'd take it out last night and i show you my faculty. I'm from Faculty of Science. Uh, this is actually the original building uh, where our university started uh, in 1962. Satellite uh, campus uh, in Kuala Lumpur. So uh, since then, uh, they have this like a scale uh, building over here. Uh, 
scale of fish. So this is another, the whole stretch of building here, this is uh, the original building. And my office way over here. <laughs> and uh, behind this building also my another office. So I have a couple of offices, uh, three offices at the moment. So I have to uh, juggle around between those three offices. And um, <coughs> the topic that uh, I'm going to talk today, uh, basically the topic that I've been working since since my undergraduate uh, in Australia, since 1990. So until today I've been working in this topic as my core topic. Uh, at the same time also uh, do other <coughs> Uh, projects such as uh, nanoparticles and things like that. Since I'm actually uh, a colloidal chemist, colloidal suspension, you know? so uh, nanomaterial and nanoparticle synthesis, uh, both uh, uh, emulsions or solid phase, actually part and parcel of uh, what we do it almost every day. Um, nevertheless, <coughs> I thought. What interests me initially was when I was uh, actually asked uh, to choose a topic, uh, I actually, during my undergraduate, I think the topic that I was interested in out of so many topics that given is on uh, solar energy conversion. Uh, until today, my industry also actually, energy is one of the niche areas uh, which Malaya is focusing. So one of the niche areas in my office, and uh, being the deputy deans and research in my faculty, we also have niche area for our uh, faculty members, which is on energy as well. So one of the focus area or the niche area that we we are, we are very good at uh, as faculty members. So um, solar energy at that time, working on uh, photosynthetic solar energy conversion, mimicking the photosynthesis. Uh, having a reaction center of the photosynthesis uh, in uh, liposome at that time. So this is when I start falling in love with bioenergy system. So uh, since then I pursue for my PhD. I've been working on fundamental science on how liposome is being formed and breakdown and what factors affecting this bioenergy membrane formation, um, including energetic uh, approach. And since then, since I came back from uh, England in 1998-1999 until today, so from 1990 till today, I've been working on that. Also. So that's our one thing as well. Right. Uh, now, if you ask me where I am. Every day, every day I'm, I have office at the back here, right? Early morning or late afternoon, maybe or sometime I drop by. My laboratory is somewhere around here. I have a couple of laboratories, so my student here, so he also around. Right? From Maza, I used to be uh, um, in my laboratory yeah. as well. So I was, I was thinking like, to learn what he has. So he's very good. Professors, researchers as well. So I always admire him. Because the work that is working is top notch. Right? I can accompany you for my so Thank you very much. Right. So, uh, the topic on uh, drug delivery uh, basically has been uh, the center point of uh, my research, my group of research, since uh, 2000, until 1990, even, until uh, when I did my PhD, I would say. And we've been focusing on a drug delivery using this bilayer membrane. Even uh, in this uh, room here, I have my student here, I think my patient student, still waiting for her <laughs> to submit that this is. And uh, working on uh, liposome. So liposome is actually my core area, at the same time, uh, I do other, other research uh, to support, uh, to financially support actually the research group that uh, ever growing used to be. <coughs> okay, just. Uh, so that uh, we won't uh, run away from uh, the topic. Um, I'll talk a little bit since uh, I was told we have a general audience here. Right? Uh, I won't actually uh, speak in detail. Uh, so I will be talking like textbook kind of uh, uh, introduction to the topic and later on a little bit on what we have done. Right? 
Uh, if you cannot find it, you just go to my name with the net and some publication in the net. And uh, we are looking at uh, what we've been thinking on uh, currently on drug delivery, especially on regulated lipids uh, in uh, chemotherapy <coughs> drugs, especially uh, even in my country, patient is still prescribed with a bad drug, just drug without any uh, uh, carrier or protection or slow release mechanism from the drug. So this is where we thought, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, people in Pakistan, but our country, we, we are not a uh, uh, rich country actually. Yeah. We, we have grants, I mean, the, the largest grant I think we, we received, my, my, I personally received from maybe uh, 500,000 US. So, um, it's over a million ringgit in this. Uh, but most of the time, in the current situation, financially we are not, we are not okay, we are not okay, but we are, we are, we are sustainable. And uh, with little grant, we have to work into what? What should we do as researcher, right? Uh, we, we are just like you guys here. Yes. You know, we are at the same level, basically. We, we are technicians, we are researchers at the same time. Some of you have to carry burden as administrator as well, just like myself. And uh, not just for you, but we have to carry the rest of the staff along with us. So with that, uh, we are thinking that we have to um, find another alternative. Uh, what's the best way to have the same property of uh, delivery vehicle for this drug? Right? At a cheaper price. Right. So we always look for alternative and uh, we go through some of it. And uh, in this case, we uh, we focus more into Katosan because the property of Katosan itself is very interesting uh, for us. And uh, I'll talk a bit on nervous preparations. Right? This is I said just now, and uh, more most of it. It's not heavy stuff. Don't worry. You know, it's just lame and kind of uh, um, slide. So uh, then. Uh, I introduce a little bit what we have done to our liposome. After we, we, we prepare and we, we study on the, the uh, slow release property, does this uh, liposome that we have prepared uh, actually toxic or it can be used, right? Uh, intravenously, right? Intravenously. So we, we done a little bit, but the one is short, but the uh, main uh, content, actually, if you're not familiar, with these uh, liposomes, or sometimes people call it a vesicle. So during my my PhD, during my undergraduate, I call it liposome. When I did my PhD, I call it vesicle. So because I differentiate between what liposomes are and what vesicles are. So um, some of us thought that vesicle is more synthetic uh, by the uh, uh, capsule or sacs, but liposome is more actually made up from naturally occurring phospholipid. So we differentiate that just to have uh, uh, correct definition because each will contribute on toxicity or bio degradability uh, uh, on our uh, on our side. So we have to consider that as well. And if you look at the liposome, basically imagine uh, anybody uh, if you're used to playing uh, unfortunately I think everywhere you go um, I, on television only saw cricket ball. <laughs> Not a tennis ball. So if you imagine you play tennis, you have tennis ball, right? Tennis ball. So uh, inside, basically, it's just air. Okay. Outside of the tennis ball, you have fluffy with uh, polymers on the outside. Right? With polymers. So if you cut this tennis ball into half, what you have a cross section of this tennis ball. You imagine your your upper bit of the tennis ball is the bilayer. So in what we are talking about now, the fluffy bit uh, outside this layer, actually uh, this is uh, sometimes we call it regulatory bit. So this is the one that we we actually synthesize, made it ourselves, right? To make sure that our phospholipid is stable and uh, has uh, maybe mucoelastic adhesive uh, or has uh, is carrying certain uh, property. And maybe give some uh, strict hindrance to strict stabilization to the uh, liposome. So yeah, I was talking about the liposome just now. So imagine this. So this is actually the bilayer made up of phospholipids. 
Okay. In industry, we're working from fatty acid to fatty acid, they are cheap source of material. You can mimic the same. You have the same understanding, not quite close to the phospholipid, but we have as your liposome, uh, liposome in the cell, but very much uh, similar, we can understand that and translate that knowledge to the phospholipid story. Because initially, we, don't, we are not very rich, we are working on cheap, easy access, very easy to prepare. Then we're moving on into more expensive and even we work on protein and uh, enzyme and, and uh, you know, these are actually very expensive. Right? Uh, nevertheless, uh, if, you start, if you cannot do that, what we did, we start from cheap material, cheap, cheap, so natural, naturally available. Especially in our country, we have palm oil, and we have a lot of fatty acids from the solution of this uh, uh, tribal's rights uh, lipids into, into fatty acids. Right? Now, if you look at the uh, cell itself, right, our, we are talking about our liposome, right, our liposome. We have the heavy bit outside. This is what we're going to be making from uh, now a commercially available uh, uh, liposome. Later on, we'll talk a little bit uh, on, on this. Uh, uh, liposome as a drug carrier and uh, just like the counterpart of the liposome remember you have still by you still have a bilayer membrane in liposome and our cell membrane is also made out of bilayer remember our cell membrane you have this uh, transmembrane protein we have uh, we have uh, not only uh, lipid you have uh, the fatty acid yeah, along with and um, even in our group, we do actually study on the uh, energetic compatibility between uh, mixtures of phospholipid. So we are looking into binary mixtures of interaction between two lipids. Because uh, as a political chemist, I know that none of the material can be mixed. Even very simple, if you are doing polymers, you have PP and PD. PP and PD, they don't mix. If you are working in a uh, Ah, oh, who's doing uh, this uh, metal alloy? Yeah, it's <laughs> not. You are working and mix two metal, for instance. So two metal, you don't look at alloy, for instance. Two metal, they don't mix because they have problem with interface with two metal. Uh, visually, they are maybe homogeneously mixed as a material, but if you look at closely, they actually don't mix. Right? Similarly, with all this uh, material. Lipids, phospholipid, fatty acids, right? uh, cholesterol, protein, they are not easily mixed. There's always uh, uh, energy that actually prevents this uh, uh, compound, this, this lipid, from uh, homogeneity. So we do study on it. At the same time, since we are actually looking into interaction between molecules, we look into interaction between this bilayer with the protein because you can to put maybe antibody in the liposome. You can specifically targeting the site that you're interested. So you can have specific targeting. So we look at the interaction between proteins and uh, bilayer in bilayer. At the same time, we also look into uh, drug interaction in the membrane itself because if you put drugs in the membrane, not necessarily the drug is there. You have to understand what kind of drug you put in. So you have to understand what molecule actually you are studying as well, right? Whether it likes water, it likes lipids, it likes oil, it likes partially water and oil, right? Because if you look at this a simple cartoon illustration of body and lipid, you can have some of the drug actually in the center of the lipid. You can actually have the drug actually positioned in the lipid body itself, right? This is hydrophobic, okay? You may, just like some protein, right? It only stays, uh, you know, along this. So you have integral protein over here, so you have some, you know, uh, drug it actually stays in the place in between the uh, head groups of the lipid and the hydrophobic layers. So this is what we are studying in detail. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just telling you what is the uh, applications from a simple membrane study that we work on. Right. So, now, uh, I actually touched with your encapsulation. 
Now, the protection, basically some of the material, if you were exposed to aqueous, right, some of drugs, or even lipid, you expose lipid to, to water, after some time it becomes hydrolyzed. So you lose, you become like fatty acid, and you have some glycerol, okay, you lose all this. Right? Very simple, you take, uh, now we are working with uh, one of the industry, uh, uh, we've been sometimes uh, in, in uh, uh, exporting, selling uh, tocotrienol, for instance. Tocotrienol is like vitamin E. We also have uh, uh, Indian uh, conglomerate, conglomerate uh, incorporation from New York, actually, would like us to work on uh, cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is extract from cannabis, right? Cannabis. So the drug actually hydrophobic. So we tell them, when we look at the, the, the structure of the drug, we know that we can encapsulate 100% of the drug into the person, right? Now, looking at this, even the protein itself, you see, you notice some of the protein is partially, if you look at this transmembrane protein, because this one, uh, uh, you can see much clearer, okay? This part of the protein, basically protein is protein, but, you know, why this protein actually sit across and part of the protein actually over here, and part actually down there because those actually those part of the uh, protein amino acid actually exposed to water they prefer to be in water those that don't like the water actually stays in it right so this is where interests us so we're talking about uh, antibody for instance so it's just like maybe integral protein so partially in the membrane partially outside so uh, you can use it in uh, uh, targeted drug delivery uh, uh, life also. Now, just quickly, as I said, uh, yeah, I, I like to talk, right? Make sure that I'm I'm on time. And so, uh, liposome, uh, you can you can actually have different uh, type of liposome. You can have very small one, right? You have nano size, less than 100 nanometer, less than 100 nanometer. Uh, but if you are talking about uh, intravenous liposome, we are talking about maybe greater than 50 nanometers, and uh, you have a large and very large one. Basically, you can form barriers that fit the size of your container. Right? You can form barriers the size of it. That's how. You can control it to as small as possible. But just like our cell, you cannot control it. Right? It grows, isn't it? It grows right? over time. However, if you want it, you want to use it for tiny, tiny technological uh, purposes, like as a drug delivery, you have to make sure that the size of the lapsome that you prepare, you see the size, you design, so I call it design, right? I don't, I don't call it, you synthesize. Uh, people say, why you say design? Because you have to make sure that if you're designing a house, what kind of house you like to have? You want to have veranda maybe, you have to have a big yard maybe, you have a hall, you have a kitchen, and each functions on its own. That's why I said we design. Right? We don't design. Even how much composition to put in, we have to make it precisely, precisely, energetically, actually suitable for these two molecules to be mixed. At that composition. You don't have to be thin, no. Right? If you don't know, you just, use differently. you just make a different concentration. But we can do, through an energetic approach, such that we can pinpoint how much more ratio we have to add in. <coughs> One pinpoint. But it's too energetic. Right? Uh, binary mixing can kind of approach. So we can do that. Right? And uh, oligomers, this is when you have the liposome inside the liposome. Liposome inside liposome, right? This is very important because recently uh, I just I just got the call uh, uh, one of our uh, we call it LRGS, which is where to uh, apply this grant in collaboration with industry. So we are we are using uh, Retromed One uh, protein. Retromed One protein. This is for uh, internet for vaginal applications, right? Uh, there are many applications. Uh, now, we can actually put the liposome inside the liposome so that we have we just one bilayer, one membrane, right? It may be destroyed, 
right? and whatever load inside you release. But if you have many membranes, many body membranes, you have liposome inside liposome. So one definitely virtually be destroyed because you know, uh, inside the pH, right? you can change whether you can get pregnant or not pregnant by changing the pH. Now, uh, we are asking about the integration of the catosan inside the cell. So, um, so far, I mean, catosan uh, has been known uh, is uh, biodegradable. Right? It's compatible, it has been checked that it's compatible, it's shown in toxicity just now. Um, it's actually non-toxic so far, even after we modified. So, catosan has known to be biocompatible and biodegradable. Have not. What we worried was, after we modified, so you see, the longer the polymer, any polymer is very long, it's difficult because the property itself is it, it, it actually uh, more dense, right? If you make it shorter, it open up, it swell, right? It swell. So shorter one, longer one is very difficult to degrade. Shorter one even easier to degrade. And we know catosan is degradable, right? So we only worry about, after we modify, you put acylated catosan, acyl, in the in the uh, the amino or hydroxyl, right? Uh, whether integrate or not. So by looking at it, does not actually kill the um, uh, the, the cell, right? It is biocompatible. When talk about degradation, we have not done the actual degradation on the modified catosan. We have not done that. But we know so far up to now that catosan is biodegradable and biocompatible. Right. How being mechanism? Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot answer that. I don't know how uh, it actually being uh, 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 degraded inside the body. Right. I mean, maybe someone else has to look into it. Right. How can this drug? Cancer drug? Yes, yeah, it's carry carry the drugs. So remember, we we we, we can put antibody, right? Okay, we can put antibody because let's take example uh, breast cancer cell. So you have overexpression of HER2, which is a like 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 antigen. So this uh, liposome can actually be present in the body up to 15, 15 days in the circulation. Right? It's not easily actually destroyed because it's been stabilized. Uh, after 15 days, I mean, uh, study have shown that after 15 days, it can it can actually stay in the body. Uh, now, since the uh, the liposome carry antibody, right? Remember, any drug that we take, let's say we take this panadol, it's very famous now everywhere. You got panadol. One panadol doesn't mean that the drug paracetamol goes to uh, yeah the the problem area that that you are suffering, right? Uh, maybe a small fraction that reach, but the rest go everywhere. But when you load, you have a carrier that can travel across your body, just like any other nutrients. Okay? It stops where you have overexpression of particular uh, cancer cell. So it stops where it is. So you have overexpression or like it's blocked over there. So when it stays there, it slowly releases. So I don't have, I think I have some data showing the slow release mechanism. So we fit into Higuchi and different, different uh, model to see, to actually see how uh, the way being released. Because this one actually, remember, it's not just simple lipid layer. It has coat around it with, with uh, catosan that besides give protection, stealth property that evade detection by the white blood cell it also actually provides slow release mechanism. So one is actually locked into these uh, overexpression of maybe take a, a breast cancer, HR2, right? It be released in that area over time, okay? So this mechanism actually eliminate toxicity. It's just like us, if you eat too much, what happened? You know, you just go lie down, I'm, I'm dying now. Right? <laughs> if you eat too much. But if you have slow release, anything slow, even poison, very minute, but not, uh, the growth uh, uh, and protein, even poison, very small amount, doesn't kill you at a time. But if you take a certain amount, of course there's a toxicity, there's a toxicity, yeah, LD50. Certain over toxicity, you die. 
the most drug, they are very toxic. They are very good cancer drugs. Not being used because it has to be used carefully due to toxicity. Right? If you have this technology, you can actually minimize or reduce or eliminate the toxicity of the drug itself because you have slow release mechanism. Few one or two molecules at a time. At the same time, it so it doesn't actually give a side effect. Hopefully, that's why uh, in uh, uh, state in, in the Europe they use this doxil more expensive because they can afford to buy. It doesn't give uh, side effect to the patient. They prefer the doxil, right? Because doesn't give a side effect. Else. Now you have uh, hair falling, vomiting, nausea, and other side effects. And if you are lucky, you survive. If you are not, you actually die because of the toxicity of the drug. Yeah. Any other questions? You can talk to me later. Yeah. Um, I have just one. In the um, network of because gel is actually a network of polymer. Gel is a network of polymer. That's why we have network of polymer. Gel is, means is a network of polymer. So we have liposome, right? you have this uh, strict stabilization, stabilized by your modified catosan just now, and is in a gel form. This one can stable to three months, no problem, even, yeah? no problem, very stable. The doxil that has been produced, right? normally it will be produced fresh because it lasted for about a month, so every time it will be produced. Right? And uh, with that, well, uh, I would like to end my talk and I mean yeah it's about time. Yeah it's about time. It's about time. Uh, well this is an old picture so yeah uh, Tawab still there from Maza. Tawab you see this is when Tawab joined me last time. So Tawab uh, this is from Rabo Institute, my former student. They are most of them are former students. So someone is over here still there. Okay, and some other students well of course uh, uh, we we have um, around I think 15 students now in, in our level three. So uh, four of my PhD graduated this year, uh, one master, and then we have what 12 to 15 students. I can't remember how many. <laughs> okay, uh, a lot of my former students that now a lecturer, they still under my armpit a little bit. <laughs> All right, thank you. But now I have been told to reduce this into half an hour. So I have to finish it within half an hour. So I will. I have to skip many slides that may create uh, discontinuity in the lecture. Uh, let me thank you all for your coming here and giving me a chance to speak to you. I see quite nice glittering faces that indicates the uh, future of Pakistan and I hope you will work most dedicatedly to get out of this crisis. So let's begin with the talk. Next slide please. Next slide please. So, I will be talking on environmental problem and sustainability. <coughs> and environment is everything that affects living organism. It is an interdisciplinary study that involves physical sciences and social sciences to learn about how the earth works, how we interact with earth, and how to deal with environmental problems. Sustainability is efforts to meet the basic needs of uh, people indefinitely without compromising same needs of future generations. One of the major problems the world is facing is energy. When we produce energy, we pollute the environments and thus affect life on Earth through climate change, unusual change in temperature, exhaustion of water resources, rise in pH of sea water, acid rains and many more. For sustainable energy sources, source and environmental security, we need to think in terms of photovoltaic devices and hydrogen and hydrogen only. So these are the two main sources of clean energy which 
might be uh, for clean environment and sustainability. Next slide, please. So, available sources of energy, there are non-renewable and renewable sources. These are fossil fuels and minerals, wind, water, fertile soil, plants and animals, and uh, perpetual sources of energy. Perpetual means never ending. So there are two wind, tides, flowing, water and geothermal. And uh, wind, tides and flowing water are weather dependent. So then you produce energy from them. We don't have any good device to store energy. So if there is a wind, we can run the windmill. Otherwise, we are uh, not getting any energy. The main source of energy is the solar energy. And the solar energy can be utilized in several ways. But the two important are photovoltaic solar panels and photolysis of water using sunlight. Photolysis means to decompose water in the presence of a catalyst in the, by throwing sunlight on it and water splits it to hydrogen and oxygen. So we, my main research area is photolysis of water using sunlight. Next slide please. So this is the composition of sunlight. Uh, from 350 nanometer to 800 nanometer, we can do, we must use, this is the main, major portion of the visible light, we must use these, uh, this region to split water. Next slide please. So we need to see what the nature is doing, uh, how uh, plant is uh, synthesizing uh, uh, sugars. So a very simple reaction that takes place in plant leaf is carbon dioxide water and necessary catalyst here and uh, it's changed into glucose and oxygen. It's not uh, as simple as written here. This reaction takes place in two steps. In first step, water is decomposed to oxygen and hydrogen ion. Then hydrogen ion from the plant cell moves to another cell which absorbs carbon dioxide where CHO bond is found, basic unit of sugar is found. Later on, this basic unit forms different uh, components of, uh, of the plant. That may be fruit, flowers, and uh, other, other parts of the plant. Next slide, please. So, in plant, recently, about three, four years before, a compound it has been isolated with X as a catalyst in plants. It is named as photosystem 2. It consists of one calcium atom and four magnesium atoms. And magnesium atoms are, uh, have, they have different uh, valency, valence state is different. So one has three, the other has four, three and four. So many scientists tried to prepare this catalyst and uh, one Chinese group made it but uh, it was not uh, very useful because the environments were entirely different than being used by the plant. We also tried to make it but uh, we made a calcium manganese complex but it was not very active because the environments were entirely different. Furthermore, we cannot induce uh, magnesium 3 and 4 in the system. Next slide, please. Most of uh, the work is on pyroscite structured material. Pyroscite structures uh, material are those which have AbO3 structure. It is uh, named after calcium titanate which was discovered in Russia by Pyrovsky and it was named after Pyrovsky uh, as Pyrovsky structure. Any compound that has ABO3, AMO3 formula can be regarded as Pyrovsky. <coughs> so A can be magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, lead and M can be a tetrablend metal. Next slide please. So this is the structure of uh, Pyrovsky. Octahedron 
where P atom is surrounded by six oxygen atoms or an X atoms and they share corners. As a result of sharing of corners, a void is left here where atom A is a void. So this is a, a perovskite structure and this is organo-inorganic perovskite which is uh, very famous uh, at the moment but uh, uh, organo-inorganic hybrid uh, structures, perovskite structures are not very stable. They are they can't, they, they can't stand harsh weather conditions. Next slide, please. So, material requirement for renewable hydrogen production. I won't go into details of current method of hydrogen production from fuel cell because of shortage of time. Uh, for photolysis of uh, water, we need cost-effective material stability to photocreate semiconducting material with narrow band gap and appropriate band positions, able to, to support vapor charge transfer at a semi-electrolyte interface, stable towards depletion from electrolyte interaction, least electronic recombination, absorption quotient must be large, hole to field length should be small, and space charge layer should be relatively large. Mixed metal oxides fulfill about this criteria, but metal sulfide and nitrides are unstable. We worked on uh, metal sulfide and few nitrides, we found them quite instable. So we sit down to metal oxides, because metal oxide seems to be better uh, uh, stable under uh, reaction conditions. Keeping all these Requirements in mind, we synthesize various types of nanomaterials and test them for their potential in photoelectrochemical water splitting. Next slide, please. So, how to make metal oxide materials? There are several different ways. One is uh, <coughs> solid state synthesis, and the next, next, yeah, here. And another is solution-based synthesis. Solid-state synthesis uh, has many disadvantages. It needs high temperature, prolonged sintering, impure phases, non aqueous products, and low performance material. This is the disadvantages of uh, solid-state synthesis. Very simple example. If you, if you mix uh, sodium chloride with silver nitrate in solid state, you keep on grinding them, make a homogeneous mixture, but reaction is never 100%. Some of the material, unreacted material, sodium chloride and silver nitrate will remain unreacted. On the other hand, if you take uh, a solution of sodium chloride and a, add a drop of uh, silver nitrate in it, you will find 100% reaction will take place within, within seconds. So that's uh, we we uh, we uh, concentrated our uh, our uh, our diversion. We choose solution-based uh, synthesis. Solution-based synthesis are hydrothermal, aqueous medium, high pressure, and autoclave is needed. Then salvothermal using non-aqueous, high pressure and autoclaves. Then another method is sole gel, where we make uh, sole uh, by using some uh, gelling material like polyethylene glycol or bisol or some other. We grind it to make a homogeneous mixture, then uh, burn it, sintrate at high temperature. And single molecular precursor is a process of my special interest. Next slide, please. So, we made several perovskite structures, uh, these uh, star materials, and uh, tested them for photocatalytic works leading to hydrogen and oxygen. And biometallic halide, we made. <laughs> किताब खोल है मगर साहिब किताब नहीं 
So the reason I'm letting you share for us is that our next speaker is not his speciality. He is an author as well. So guys, with your huge round of applause, love and respect, our very own Dr. Muhammad Mazhar from Nast University.
the exposed part of your sample to replicate the stuff, the, the stuff over here. Uh, or when you are uh, techniques of adding techniques such as the position of particular materials that can be exploited for etching or you do the etching and then the position uh, so you can combine in infinite way the, 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 the techniques that are available in order to obtain uh, the same uh, this is an example of uh, dry etching. This is the deep reactive fire etching. Uh, the system is pretty simple. You have the subject, generally that is uh, seen in silicon, right from the strength industry. And you have a suitable mass, a metallic mass, generally. By using a suitable gas for the subject that you are using, you can certainly remove the silicon on the exposed area. Then you passivate uh, the structure that you need, then you etch again, and you are replicating this cycle many times, obtaining these deep structures here. These are some examples of structures that we produce with this technology uh, of uh, reactive fire uh, what is the use of this structure? So we use this uh, high resolution pillar to uh, make uh, biological sensors. Uh, this is the selection of uh, the communication that we did for the uh, fast detection of biomolecule in, uh, in liquid. Simply, uh, we use uh, these pillars to have a several super hydrophobic uh, surface. Um, so that I must explain what is a super hydrophobic surface. So when you have a really uh, high resolution structure here and you are personalizing the surface of this structure, the liquids, particularly the water, can wet inside this structure, but is somehow suspended on top of this. Uh, more pillars and uh, you are creating kind of uh, uh, water uh, spacing in between the liquid and the stuff. By moving this or uh, oscillating these uh, uh, pillars you can appreciate what is uh, deposited on top of these pillars by measuring uh, simply the resonation frequency, the frequency of resonation, uh, more or less, from all from the classical UV infrared. So we can steal it from photolithography, this again UV lithography. Now we are moving on extreme UV, that is uh, the technology that is used for uh, the modern. Uh, electronic industry. Or, for example, for with uh, X-rays, that is needed to reduce the uh, length uh, of the light, I mean, uh, the wavelength of the light, I can reduce, obviously, the diffraction limit. This is why we are moving down and down up to X-rays. Obviously, if for UV lithography, a quite simple instrument is needed. This is simply the mask aligner. So, uh, I don't know if that Okay. Uh, a simple mask aligner where you are positioning the mask here, the sample here, and you are exposing through these optics your sample. But the source of the light is a simple uh, lamp, a mercury uh, buffer lamp. And uh, but if you want to move with much lower uh, wavelength, you have larger and larger uh, tools that you need. For X-ray, obviously, you need a, a really large <laughs> tool that is a, a synchrotron that can provide the X-rays that is needed for the lithography. And 
it's not the size, just the size, the the, 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 the problem of this, but it's obviously the cost of this. While an instrument like this, we are talking about hundreds of kilo euros, or dollars, while here it's million, and this is more than 10 billion, 10 million, sorry. So, this is the first thing that we must think when you are thinking about lithography. What is needed? Because to reduce the size of the pattern that you need, you must think that you need more time and you have higher cost for your thing. So, uh, I will speak about some of these other technology, but so, uh, in the case, so we have technology based on the use of the top to beam, right here, yeah, top sign, or use electrons, ions, or particles. Then interference lithography, that is similar to uh, top lithography. Scanning probe lithography, that deriving from uh, other technologies such as EFM, STM, non imprinting, soft lithography, shadowing mass, and so on. So, in uh, this uh, graph, I show you how is the relationship between the resolution that you can achieve with 